begins with, why was the law given? If you look at those first few uh, words there, it says, why then was the law given? This is a good and logical question. After all, we've spent the better part of two months walking through Galatians, repeating over and over, quote, you are justified by faith and not through works of the law. There's two Christian buzzwords already, faith and law. Justified, there are three actually. We have learned about the Apostle Paul's supernatural commission, his supernatural message, and the affirmation that he received in regards to his work as an evangelist. We know that the false teachers, called Judaizers, plagued the early church in Galatia with a toxic and dangerous heresy. They said you must have faith in Jesus Christ plus do the works of the law to be saved. In light of this and Paul's detailed description of what justification by faith is, one should wonder, Why the law? Why? Why was it even given? Indeed, if it is useless, if it cannot save, if it is in opposition with the true gospel message, then why did God ever give it or record it in his holy word? The answer is simple and beautiful. The law is a tool given by God to show us, a sinful humanity, why we live in a state of guilt, why we are cursed to perish And why we are separated from God outside of Jesus Christ. The law shows us that we must desperately search and trust in a Savior that's outside of ourselves. Let's hear what Paul says as to the purpose of this law. So if you're with me, we're in verse 19 of chapter 3. It says, why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power, so that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. There's no better statement than verse 26. For through faith, through trust, through dependence, On Jesus Christ alone, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. I can't think of any dad that I'd want to have more than the God of the universe. I can remember being in elementary school and seeing other kids with their dads and you always think their dads are better. Their dads took them to the Eagles game. Mine made me sit on the couch and yell at Randall Cunningham all afternoon. Right? That dad was the dad I wanted. But the reality is what we all really want, whether we acknowledge it or not, is for the God of the universe to be our dad. The sad truth that Paul is talking about in these verses 
and through all of Galatians is the reality that all of humanity is sinful and separated in their relationship from God. But thank the Lord that he sent his only begotten son to come and do what we couldn't do and to pay for that sin debt so that we might be justified or legally counted as innocent in front of a holy God. The problem that is faced in the first century in this community that Paul's writing to is that there were false brothers and sisters coming and preaching a different gospel. They were saying, it's good to believe in Jesus, but you also have to be Jewish. That means you have to be circumcised. You have to follow the dietary laws. The Ten Commandments need to be followed. And if you don't do these, Jesus doesn't save you. It's Jesus gives you some and you do the rest. How does that apply to us today? Well, I need to clean myself up a little bit before I come to the living God who is Jesus Christ. Well, I need to make my life a little bit better before I make that commitment to turn to Christ in faith. Or I'm a Christian and I've done those things and now I have to, by my own will, my own effort, make myself holy, pull myself up from my bootstraps and continue to earn what God has already freely given me. These are heresies. This is not biblical. These are the kinds of things that, if believed, means that you were never saved to begin with. Because if you can take any credit for what God has done for you, you're stealing his glory. The point of all that God has done in creation and for you and for us and about us is about him receiving maximum glory. For him to be the most famous. And for him to exalt himself ready through his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who is the image of God in flesh. This is what Paul's dealing with. And in these verses that we just read, I think the main point that we'll see today is that the law was a temporary covenant given to teach humanity about sin, to show a need for Jesus, and to guide us to the promise which is becoming sons and daughters of God. There's lots of words in there. Seed, promise, salvation. It really is all about Jesus. You know, that's what's so beautiful about scriptures. We can read it and read it and go front to back, back to front. And at the end of the day, if you're in a Sunday school class and they say, what's it about? Just say Jesus and you're right. It's about Jesus. Paul lays out three purposes of the law in our text today. Three purposes. The first is to define and teach and show us what sin is. Without God defining what is good or righteous... And what is sin or outside of his boundaries, how would we know? We wouldn't. The second purpose was to show that the promise is only received by faith in Jesus. And what is the promise? It's the blessing that God gave or told Abraham that all of his descendants would receive. What is that blessing? It is being justified in front of God. It is being counted as innocent. It's being made right by God. It's that relationship that we want with God the Father who we want to call Abba. But instead it's separated because of our sin. It's the healing of that relationship. That's the promise. The third purpose is to make us realize that the promise is us becoming God's children. Ultimately it's about a relationship. It's about a relationship that a loving God entitles us to that we don't deserve so that he can receive glory and we get all the benefit for something we didn't do. It's the greatest deal on earth. The purpose of the law is to define, teach, and show what sin is. If we look at the first part of verse 19. It says, why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of, of transgressions. Transgressions is sin. Transgressions is Outside of the lines, if you look at the Greek word, uh, it, it means kind of like here are the boundaries and I'm stepping outside of them, right? I'm going on my own path. The law was there to show us what the clear path was. You see, before the law was given to Moses on Mount Sinai in redemptive history, there uh, was no clear path. There was no technical knowledge of sin. Now, Paul tells us in the book of Romans that the law is kind of written on our hearts, that we're really without excuse whether we know it or not. But because God is a God of reason and logic and wants to close all loopholes, he gave Moses the Ten Commandments that summarized his moral character so that we had really no excuse to then say, but God, I didn't know. See, before the law, sin ran rampant. Humanity was, was just totally 
far afield from what God wanted them to be. Humanity was only concerned for itself. How much pleasure can I get? How much fame or fortune or power? I'm speaking about real people in a real point in history. I'm talking about before the flood of Noah. I'm talking about before Abraham was called out of um, what is now modern day Iraq to go to the land of Canaan. Sin had no restraint at this time. There was no boundary lines. In Genesis 6, we get a picture of this. In verse 5, it says, When the Lord saw the human wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every inclination of the human mind was nothing but evil all the time. Friends, brothers, sisters, we're no different today before we meet Christ. Our minds and our hearts only care about ourselves. We can put a stamp of approval on it and say, yeah, but, but it's not bad. I'm not hurting anybody. But you're not putting God first in your life. And I think that's the first commandment. But even after Noah, so what happened? God looks at the earth and he says, look at humanity. Look at how sinful they are. We're not even going to mention the deeds. It was so wicked and so vile. God wasn't even a, 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 it wasn't even a microscopic hint in their subconscious. So God judged the world. He picked out a a family of his choosing, Noah and his family. He saved them by putting them on on the ark and rightly judged the rest of humanity. And then they started over. So they got it right, didn't they? Noah and his family get out and they populated the earth and kumbaya. Absolutely not. They continued to sin, believe it or not, because we do what we want. Genesis 11 says, and they said, come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let's make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered throughout the earth. Did you catch the part to make a name for themselves? This is the story of the Tower of Babel. God has killed every human on the face of the earth, bar Noah and his family. He's restarted salvific history, start over Worship me, and even after Noah and his family get off the ark, sin immediately happened, and you can go and read those stories. But after a while, as humans populated the earth, what are they concerned about? Worshiping the God of the universe that created them? No. Are they worried about giving thanks for God saving Noah and his family so that they would exist? No. They wanted to make a name for themselves. Because ultimately in our hearts, it's about us being God and not God being God. But as I've said before, and I'll say again and give credit to my old pastor, God's God and we're not, and that's good. The law shows us our horrible state of guilt. It did it for the Galatians in the first century. It did it for the Jews before the birth of Christ. And it does it to every non-Christian today. The law separates us from God. It shows us our wicked and evil hearts. And it gives us no excuse before him. Let me give you an illustration, not even an illustration, an example. It's easy to say, I'm a good person. But when you measure yourself against the proper measuring stick, you find that you fall drastically short. You will have no other gods except for me. How many times do we put anything in front of God? You've just broken the first commandment. Don't lie, right? That's a commandment. How many times have you lied today? If you're like me, probably more than you realize. Don't murder. Every time we have a hateful or angry thought in our heart, we've murdered our brother or sister. That's what Jesus said. So the law shows us that. The law is God's character. It's perfection. It's moral righteousness. The law is not evil. The law is not bad. The law is not just the first five books of the Bible with the 1600 or excuse me, the 613 precepts, rules and obligations summarized in the Ten Commandments. It's literally who God is put in words. It's what God always does and never does wrong. And our standard is that to be perfect as God is perfect. Romans 3, 19 to 20 says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law so that every mouth may be shut and the whole world may be subject to God's judgment. For no one will be justified in his sight by works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. The knowledge of sin. This is important. This is important. So the purpose of the law is to define and show us God's goodness and our sinfulness. But then in the next part of the verse, if you look back at verse 19, it says... 
until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. So what Paul is saying is the covenant with Moses on Mount Sinai that God bless you that, that you're welcome that that contract of contracts that God made with Moses the unbreakable covenant was never meant to be permanent. The law was never meant to be the way that we come into right relationship with God. It was a placeholder for something better. The law was a way to teach us, to guide us, to mold us, to show us what we should have known already, but are too selfish to see. The law is preparation. It's training for the final moment. Do you know what the final countdown, you know that song? It's the final countdown. If you're a marching band student, you know that song or from the 80s, right? Either one. And so what is that final moment, that final countdown? It's when we have to give an account to God. That will come for 10 out of 10 people, whether you believe that or not. It creates a a response in our heart when we see the law and our mouths are shut and we hear it and we measure ourselves against it. We realize that we need something that we can't do for ourselves. And listen, until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. We said it's temporary. Well, how temporary? Until the seed comes. What's the seed? That's old-fashioned speak for... Abraham was told that all nations would be blessed through him. And he had kids and they had kids and they had kids. And that seed was each kid coming down the line and then, bam, here comes Jesus. He's the seed. Jesus is the seed. He was the one that was prophesied about. In Genesis 3, when God said to Eve that he will crush the serpent's head and the herpent, or the serpent, sorry, will bruise his heel. This is the seed that that spoke of. This is the the way that Abraham would bless all peoples and nations by Jesus, who would be his descendant. Jesus is the king that will reign on David's throne forever. Jesus is the seed. He is what all of scripture speaks of. And listen, unlike Noah and Abraham and Moses and even Adam and Eve, who all had covenants with God, signed with blood. When Jesus comes, he institutes a new covenant. And that's a better covenant. You see, the law, the law was different than any other covenant God gave. And this is important to see here. In verse 19, the last part, it says the law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. What does that mean? Well, it means this. When God dealt with Adam and Eve, it was God doing all parts of the covenant. God saw that Adam and Eve had sinned. And instead of doing what he said he would do and killing them for their transgression... He gave them kind of a little bit of a buffer zone, right? He said, all right, I'm going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to send you out of the Garden of Eden. Here's the agreement. You are now going to live in a cursed world where there is pain and suffering, where there is sadness, where there is hard work, right? Where you don't just get something for nothing. You're going to have to work for everything you get. And now you know you're naked. Now you know what sin is. So I'm going to clothe you and I'm going to kill this animal. Remember, something had to die for that skin to be on Adam and Eve. There's the first covenant, the first death to cover humanity's sin. But God did all of that. And Adam and Eve lived and they lived to have kids and the human race continued. The covenant between Noah and God. God did it all. God told Noah to build the ark. God shut the door. God brought the flood. God took away the flood. God put Noah in a place to reproduce. God did both sides of that. He did it all. It was all God. Abraham the same way. Abraham worshipped the moon god. He lived in this place that had nothing to do with the God of the Bible. And out of nowhere, God says to Abraham one day, get up and go. And he did. And Abraham believed God when he said, one day I will make your offspring like the stars of the skies and all nations will be blessed through you. That covenant was all God. But here comes Moses. And Moses on Mount Sinai... Sinai, Sinai, whatever, right? On Mount Sinai gets a different kind of a covenant. It had angels and a mediator. So now for the first time you have God who meets Moses on the mountain. And he comes with thousands of his holy ones. That's his angels. And gives Noah the covenant of the law. Now for the first time God gives his part. And says to Moses, who is the mediator, who represents God to all of the nation of Israel. He says, you must do your part. And if you do it, that's the law, you will be blessed. But if you don't do your part, 
you will be cursed. This was never meant to be permanent because we fail at this. Read the Old Testament. Read the book of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Go back to Samuel. Look at the book of Judges. We are so hopeless when it comes to following rules. We can't do it. God knew this. It was a tutor. It was to show us. Moses stood as the mediator between man and God. This covenant was given to Moses by and through angels. Exodus 33.1 says, This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, gave the Israelites before his death. He said, The Lord came from Sinai and appeared to them from Seir. He shone on them from Mount Paran and came with 10,000 holy ones, with lightning from his right hand for them. We go on to verse 20, and it says, Now a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Remember we said that with Adam and Eve, Adam, Noah, Abraham, God did it all, right? He did all of the covenant. But now in the Mosaic law, the one that we're, we're, I know we're going back in time, but this is important, right? We're talking about Galatians. It takes two sides, man's responsibility and God's response. Obey in blessing, disobey in judgment. Here's the reality. The law forced man to account for God's standard, which he never was supposed to before, right? So now man is not just walking through life, hoping that God will forgive him, hoping that God will bless him, trying to do what he thinks right. Now man knows exactly what God expects. He knows exactly God's requirements. Well, then does the law contradict God's promise? That's the next question that the Judaizers would have asked in arguing with Christians about why they had to do the works of the law. But here's the reality. The law does not change or contradict God's promises or the covenant with Abraham. Listen to what verse 21 says. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Paul loves posing questions that he knows they're asking in their heart, right? And then he answers it. Absolutely not! Exclamation point. By the way, there was no exclamation points in Greek, so he probably wrote really big letters. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. Remember, law, law, law. We're saying it over and over. All that is, is the Ten Commandments and all of what God said we had to do in the first five books of the Bible. Just remember that. Keep that in the back of your mind. So here's what Paul's saying. It doesn't contradict. The law is not some kind of alternate path that will also lead to eternal life and a better relationship with God. It doesn't do that. If that was the case, then God would not say a promise. He would say, or he would not say the promise. Excuse me. He would say a promise. If the law was a way to get eternal life with God, if it could justify us, well, then it would make everything else irrelevant, wouldn't it? We learned that a couple weeks ago. It said then Christ would have been crucified for nothing. The law is a path maker. It's a path revealer. It points us to God's standard and expectations, and it illuminates to our detriment how we are separated from him. Nowhere does the law say it brings life. Look through it. All the Ten Commandments. All of the stuff in Leviticus that we get to in February with our year through the Bible plan and we kind of stop, right? All that stuff, nothing says do this and you will live forever. It says do this or else. It says you might get out of your earthly judgment if you like kill a few animals and spill some blood, but be perfect. That's basically what it says. It reveals to us that we are not the promise. That's important. We need something else. The promise is the right relationship with God. We can't make that promise happen on our own effort. We live in a world and a society today that is increasingly secular, that is increasingly, un and it's not just secular because they're saying, I want to be separate from religion. It's secular in the sense that there's no knowledge of God anymore. There is no biblical education in homes. And this doesn't go for the Christian faith, this goes for all faiths, right? Our world is turning more and more humanistic. We're, we're worshiping ourselves. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this to say that we are increasingly told that we can be our own saviors. We are increasingly told that if we just follow our heart, our dreams will be realized. We're increasingly told that everything's possible if you just work hard enough. We're increasingly told that if you just be a good person, life will be great. But here's what I want to tell you the Bible says. Where's the definition of a good person? Where's that definition at? And in what universe has man ever created something better by his own efforts? I haven't seen it yet. 
The reality is this. The definition of being a good person is the law. That's the definition. And that's why Paul goes on in verse 22 to say in the first part, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin's power. The law constrained and forced us to strive for righteousness. You see, under the law, sin has all the power and you can't escape it. Oh my gosh. I just said escape. Let me say this again. You can't escape it. This is it. Yeah, we're, we're, our language is changing and I don't like it. Um, you, you can't escape it. The law gives us the definition of good and it leaves us without an excuse and it shows us the prison bars we couldn't see were already there. Some would argue, well, what are you saying, Chuck, that like, you know, in the Bible, like before God gave the law to Moses, like everybody was good, like it wasn't sin because they didn't know. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying they ignored the bars. They were in a prison made by their sin, right? And they wanted to ignore the bars. Maybe they decorated it and they put some flowers on it and some VBS decorations. I don't know. And they made it look real nice. But when the law comes and we see God's standard, all of a sudden those bars are laid bare. And we realize what our circumstance truly is. This is why the definition of good is relative today. Because today when people ignore the law, when they ignore the bars, they can make up any definition they want for goodness. We see it in the news. It's not about politics. It's not about Republican or Democrat. It's about issues from here to here. Right? We have situations today in today's world where, and the Bible says it will happen in Isaiah. Good will be called evil and evil will be called good. And the further we go from looking at God's perfect standard, the more we go down the miry pit of self-destruction. Good is not what we define it. Good is what God defines us. Or excuse me, defines it. And that's the purpose of the law. See, the law allows us to do this. We can look good on the outside. We can check the boxes. We can, well, pretend to follow the commandments, right? We can do all the good stuff, right? But in our hearts, there's no real change. That's another way that the law imprisons us. It reveals the heart sickness that we all have. This is why the Jewish leadership, when Jesus was on earth, hated him so much. Because he told them it didn't matter what you did. It didn't matter how fancy you dressed, how many prayers you said, or how many times you went to the temple and did those things. Your heart is wickedly against me. That was his message to them. That's our problem today. You see, here is an illustration. The law and and how we are justified by faith is like the donkey, the carrot, and the stick. You've seen this, right? You got a little donkey little stick coming off of its head somehow, and there's a carrot. And what's the image? The donkey keeps walking after the carrot, but it never gets there, right? Well, the carrot, the carrot is the promise. The carrot is the restored relationship with God. The stick is the law, and the donkey is us. And here's what the law does. It shows us the standard for justification, and we want it, so we try and we work. I'm going to try to be good. I'm going to be try to be good. But it doesn't matter how fast we run, how hard we run, we never get to that carrot. Because the law keeps us from it. Because every time we try to get three steps closer, that stick gets longer because we messed up a little bit. And it gets longer and longer. And that effort is pointless. It's pointless. We need somebody to take that carrot off the stick and shove it in our mouth. Donkeys don't have arms. The last time I checked, right? So somebody's got to do it for the donkey. Seeing the carrot, though, makes us want it. And that's the purpose of the law. It shows us the standard of perfection. It shows us the avenue to get right with God. And we want it. So the law shows us that carrot we desperately want. The promise of a repaired relationship with God. And it keeps us in a state of striving, but to failure. This is not for nothing or for cruelty. This is actually merciful grace. It is so when we recognize the carrot is Jesus, we can simply trust him and receive the promised blessing. Now, it sounds like I'm giving you an Old Testament lesson, and I am. But why? Because you have to understand the purpose of the law. The Judaizers were telling the Galatians that faith is not enough. Paul is saying that that's all you can do. If you try to work, you're not saved. You have to put your whole trust in Jesus. 
So if we understand the purpose of the law, then we won't make that mistake, will we? If that's why Paul's putting it out right here. We need to know that the law was not meant to save, but to point us to Christ. And that brings us to our second purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to show that the, pers- the promise, excuse me, is only received by faith in Jesus. The last part of Galatians, uh, verse 22 in chapter 3 to 23 says this. So that the promise might be given on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. Notice the words confined and imprisoned. This is legal uh, terminology. We were being held against our will with no escape. Escape. We were told to perform or be punished. There was no bail to get out. We had to perfectly adhere to the rules or we're put in solitary confinement. But the good news is that this is not a permanent confinement. We are confined until the new covenant. That's the coming faith. So when it says before the faith came, that faith is the new covenant in Christ's blood. And we're going to celebrate that together today at the Lord's table. You see, God, in his plan of redemption, made sure that we were very clear on who he was, who we are, and what we truly needed. So that when he revealed the promised seed, who is Jesus, we would understand our need for him. If no law had been given, if we had no idea who God's standard or what God's standard was, would we turn to Christ? The answer is no. Just go on any street corner in modern day America and go up to a random person and say, if you just ask Jesus into your heart, you'll be saved. And you know what they're probably going to say to you? I don't need to be saved. And they're going to walk away. Why do I need Jesus? As a friend of mine once said, they're not, he's not going to pay my bills. He's not going to help me with the, with the real world issues I have. But if you go to people and you say, do you know that you're not a good... I'm not saying say it like this, right? But this is the message like... Are you a good person? Why, yes, I am. Well, let's test it. Have you ever told a lie? Well, of course. Have you ever stolen anything? Nope. Have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours? Well, yeah, I've done that. Well, then you've stolen. Have you ever taken the Lord's name in vain? Right? We could go down that list. What we find out very quickly is that there are no good people, according to God's definition. Isn't that what Paul said in that Romans verse, so that it would shut people's mouth? That's what it means. I can't talk. I I have no excuse. Now we know why we need Jesus. Now we know that Jesus isn't about paying our bills. Jesus isn't about giving us riches or helping us with. And I mean, he does and he and he's there to support us and all that stuff. But ultimately, the purpose of Christ is to save you from your worst sickness, your worst uh, issue of poverty, to save you from your worst predicament. And that's eternal punishment for the sins that you've committed and are justly convicted to. That's why we need Jesus. And that's why God gave the law. But it's not permanent. Jesus is the coming faith. And in this new covenant, we're going to learn that God did both sides, just like he did before the law. This new covenant is the promise. Look at verse 24. It says, the law then was our guardian until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. Remember, justified is a legal term. It means to be found innocent, to be found righteous. To be found pleasing to God. Without being justified, we have no hope. But it says the law was our guardian. This is imagery Paul's using in Rome in the first century, in the Roman Empire, which Galatia fell in. If you were a rich Roman citizen and you had kids, you would get one of your slaves to be your child's guardian. Kind of like a nanny or whatever the male version. Was it an au pair? Is that a male? Did I, did I remember that? I don't know. Whatever the male version is, right? Um, And they would kind of like be in charge of raising the child. Now that child was the heir to the the father's stuff, right? It's a son or whatever. But that guardian treated that child very harshly. This is real, right? He would make sure that he was educated, that he learned discipline, that he learned the ways of the world. And it was a harsh rebuke if that child stepped out of line. But that's the heir to the father's fortune. But not temporarily while he's under that guardian. He's being trained. He's being tutored. It's a lot like when I went to basic training. I went in, I joined the army, and I was so proud. I'm going to serve in the army. I got my uniform, clickety-clack, let's go Jack, right? 
I go to basic training and the next thing I know I'm getting yelled at, I'm being doing push-ups. I mean, I got everything that I did in a day is micromanaged to the, to the smallest detail. If I stepped out of line, just a, a hint, right, that drill sergeant was all over me. But then one day, I learned discipline. I learned the ways of the military. And I graduated basic training. Now, I wore the same uniform, but I was treated as who I always was. A soldier to do the work of the United States. And I was free, if that makes sense. I I didn't have to account to a drill sergeant anymore. I didn't have to make my bed just so. I could go to my job every day and operate as an autonomous human being within the constructs of that of that given organization. That's what the law does for us. That's why it's a guardian. It's a boot camp to teach us our need for a savior. We graduate when we realize that we are who God said we are and God is who he said he is and all we need to do is trust Jesus. That's boot camp graduation. Then we're free. Now we can be a full-fledged member of God's kingdom. You see, the law was not based on love. But performance and execution, it was pass or fail. If you're in the military, it's go or no go. It's black and white. The law tutors us that we must trust the perfect work of Jesus. This is where we need to land today. You trust the perfect work of Jesus. He is the seed, the promise, and the blessing that is being talked about. And here's why we trust him. He's the only one that could ever keep the law 100%. Because he's God. If the law is who God's character is, then only God can be that. And that's the beauty of Jesus. He is the new and better covenant or the faith that's spoken about. You see, the law, God's code of moral righteousness, drives us to claim Jesus' identity as our own. This is what justifies us and restores our relationship with God. This is the promised blessing. The third and final purpose of the law that Paul gives is to help us know the promise is us being God's children. This is verse 25. Take a look with me. And 26. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. The faith has come. Ladies and gentlemen, a new covenant has come. And it wasn't on Mount Sinai like with Moses. If you read that account in Exodus, it was scary stuff. Smoke and fire. And I mean, the words even in the Bible probably don't do it justice. It says the sound of trumpets. Let me tell you something. The sound of a trumpet back then was pretty like bagpipes, right? (laughs) Times a billion. What does it sound like with ten thousands of God's holy ones and flaming lightning coming out of God's right hand and smoke coming down on a mountain? What does that sound like? What does that look like? It's so scary that the Jews, the Israelites, said, Moses, don't let us go near God. He's too scary. It's horrific. It's absolutely something that you can't be in the presence of. That's why we needed a mediator. But... Here's what Jesus did. Jesus did all that we were told to do on Mount Sinai. And then in a small upper room, he gathered with his 12 disciples the night before he would be betrayed and sacrificed on our behalf. And he would say this. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup, ready, is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So humble, so simple, so understated, but three gajillion times more powerful and impactful than Mount Sinai. The new covenant is more powerful than the law. Ready, it's more better than the law. And it's more effective than the law. The covenant of the law doesn't give us anything that's positive other than what we deserve. But the new covenant gives us the total 100% love of God because Jesus did what we should or what we should have done. And in this, Jesus performs both parts of the covenant. Jesus gave himself. He was the perfect sacrifice. A covenant needs blood to be ratified. A contract needs ink to be signed. There was blood with Adam and Eve, with Noah, with Abraham. There was blood with Moses through the whole law and sacrificial system. And now there is blood. But unlike Moses, where we sacrificed in the temple, 
God sacrificed himself. Jesus suffered the wrath of God, which was the penalty for us breaking the past covenants. Jesus did God's part and our part simultaneously. Jesus gives us life and he obeys perfectly on our behalf. Jesus provided the sacrifice and because he's God, he accepted the sacrifice. Think about them apples. He received the penalty of sin, yet upheld the covenant perfectly. He was fully God and fully man so that he could do both, so that you could be sons of God. And if you don't get goosebumps, man, woo, love me some Jesus. Sorry, getting a little out of control here. Sobriety of mind, they say. All other covenants by God are now inferior and obsolete because of the new covenant. They're not different. They weren't bad. They all pointed to this one. Instead of calling it the new covenant, we need to call it the final covenant. We need to call it the covenant, the covenant that was already planned. And now we have direct access to God's grace, his mercy, and his blessings. We don't need to go through a priest. We don't need to go through Moses. We don't need to go through the law. We don't need to go through anything. We have access because Christ lives in us. This new covenant brings eternal life. Jesus rose from the dead, so death is now defeated. Jesus clothes us in his goodness. And because of that, he restores our relationship with God. And the best part is that Jesus makes us sons and daughters of God. What does that mean? It's not just an emotional warm and fuzzy. It's legal again, like being justified. It means that we are legal and rightful heirs of God's kingdom. You can't get any inheritance better than that. And listen, this is the part that we all have to really focus on. It's only possible to partake in this new covenant if you are in Christ. That's what it says. For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. So the question for us today is this. How do we be in Christ? How do we do that? Well, it's simple. Believe God like Abraham did, right? Didn't we learn that from Paul last week? Faith is the same as the faith Abraham. He believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. But what do we believe? I mean, what, what do we believe? There's a lot to believe. Well, let me break it down for you into six quick parts. One, you have to believe that Jesus is the son of God. Matthew 3, 17 says, and a voice from heaven said, that's God's voice. This, who is Jesus, is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. God said that it was his son. So guess what? It's his son. Number two, Jesus is fully man. Philippians 2, 7 says, instead, he, meaning Jesus, emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity, and when he had come as a man. Jesus is fully God. The third one, John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is God. Jesus is perfect in every way. 1 Peter 2.22, He, meaning Jesus, did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Five, Jesus' death satisfies God's wrath for our sins. Romans 5, 8 to 9. But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? We're not saved from the world. We're not saved from the devil. We're not saved from your bad day. We're saved from God by God. That's good news, believe me. Finally, Jesus makes us one with him, thus making us sons and daughters of God. John 14, 18 to 21, Jesus says this to his disciples. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my father. You are in me and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. I also will love him and will re reveal myself to him. It's like a God stromboli, man. It's all in there mixed together, ooey goodness. And it's the best kind. Jesus makes us one with him. And because he's God's son, we are God's sons and daughters. So if we believe God... In what he has revealed in the scriptures, then we are free from the standard that we can't meet. 
We are legally made innocent through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. We are made to live forever because Jesus rose from the dead. We are justified because we believed God and trusted in his son. This is the promise that was made to Abraham. This is the king that will sit on David's throne forever. And this is the new covenant signed in Jesus' perfect blood that heals our relationship with a perfectly just and loving holy God. The law is not a path for salvation. It is not a wrong turn or alternate way. The law is temporary covenant established through Moses that teaches us about who we are and who God is. The law guards us and keeps us focused on our greatest problem, sin. But better than all of that, the law points us like a drill sergeant to our goal and hope, faith in Jesus Christ. He is the new and better Adam. He is the one who did all that Israel failed to do. He is the one that accomplished what no man could even hope to do. Obey God perfectly and pay your debt of sin to him who demands justice. That's what Jesus did that we couldn't. We are not just made innocent by trusting in Christ. We are also adopted as sons and daughters. In Christ, we are clothed with his attributes and identity and allows God to see his beloved son in us. Of course, he loves us like sons and daughters. Let's pray. Thank you.